Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're very pleased to have Jennifer Lee with us today for a discussion of the exhibition Collective Constellation, selections from the Eileen Harris Norton collection, which was, um, I guess is on display at Art and Practice in Lamert Park, um, interrupted as is everything else by our current situation. Um, for, I think we may have a few guests with us today, so I just wanna give a quick, um, plug of PAC LA, the Photographic Arts Council. We are an evolving conversation inviting the people of Los Angeles and beyond these days to be engaged, inspired, and empowered by photography and photo-based art. And I encourage you to visit our website at paclosangeles.com to learn more about us and the things that we do. Um, so let me introduce Jennifer, um, and I want to give a quick thank you to Claire Cooney and our friends at Art Muse who um, helped us put this event together today. Uh, thank you. So Jennifer Lee, we're very pleased to have Jennifer with us today. Uh, I think we're really looking forward to this presentation. Um, she received her BA in the History of Art from the University of California, Berkeley and her MA in Modern Art History, Theory and Criticism from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her professional experience in museums includes positions at the Art Institute of Chicago, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the J. Paul Getty Museum. She also oversaw the daily operations and exhibition programs at the Michael Cohn Gallery in Los Angeles. Currently, she is the desk editor for Art Asia Pacific, the leading English language periodical covering contemporary art and culture from Asia, the Pacific, and the Middle East. And she is a regular contributor to Art in America, Freeze, and other publications. Jennifer is a founding member of Art Muse LA. Um, and you can learn more about Art Muse, artmuse.com, I think. Artmusella.com. Artmusella.com. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, quick housekeeping. Um, you'll notice there is a Q&A button at the bottom. I know many of us have done, started to do a lot of Zoom things, so you may know this, but um, uh, at the end of Jennifer's presentation, we will uh, have a period of time for questions and answers. So be thinking of that uh, as we go along. And um, I will come back after the presentation to help sort of moderate that Q&A period. So you can type in your questions that, uh, by using that Q&A button at the bottom. Okay, so with that said, I think I will say goodbye and I will be back in a little bit and turn it over to Jennifer. Okay, thank you. So good morning, everybody. So happy to be here with you today. I have to um, admit I'm a bit nervous. I've done hundreds of lectures. I used to work at the Getty, worked there for six years, um, but I've never done a Zoom webinar. So I'm a little bit nervous, but I think it'll all be okay. Um, so we're going to talk today about um, the show that's currently up at Art and Practice, which is actually a gallery that's right near my house. So it's um, an institution that I uh, really enjoy, uh, that I hold dear to my heart. Um, it's in Lamert Park, which uh, we'll, uh, we'll discuss a little bit of its history later, um, but it actually is considered, um, at one point in the 60s, it was called the Harlem of the West. So it's really kind of a birthplace of um, black culture, um, people like Ella Fitzgerald and Ray Charles um, lived in this area and we'll learn more about uh, this area as we go on. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start. This is, uh -oh. Oh, I'm sorry about this technical difficulties. Uh -oh. For some reason I'm not able to click to the next slide. Uh -oh. oh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so this is the illustrious woman that, we'll be, that we will be discussing today. Her, her name is Eileen Harris Norton, and um, hers is the collection that we'll be exploring a little bit today. She has a really diverse collection, including people like Frank Gehry, Yoshitomo Nara, who's going to have a show later this year um, at LACMA. Um, and here she's shown, um, so a, a diverse collection, not just female, not just women of color, uh, but that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. That's what the show at Art and Practice focuses on. Um, and you can see uh, in this image here taken from Architectural Digest, a really wonderful profile of her home. Um, it's actually, uh, the, the home is a craftsman home in Santa Monica. 
um, the same architects as um, the Rose Bowl and, and a few other important um, spots around town. Um, but the center there above the mantelpiece is a piece by, is a painting by abstract expressionist Alma Thomas, who's an underappreciated African American abstract expressionist working around the same time as Jackson Pollock, Lee Krasner, Helen Frankenthaler, but of course not as much a household name as those artists. Um, on the mantle also is a little sculpture by Kara Walker, which, um, you know, very, very famous artist, um, an artist that says, um, you know, a, a silhouette is like a, a, a stereotype. It gives us, um, it, you know, it conveys a lot with very little information, um, which I think is such a poignant quote. Um, and then at the bottom there, um, this is an artist we'll talk later, uh, this, um, this little egg here, this little golden egg is actually um, the artist Sean Shim Boyle, and he's actually um, a studio assistant to Mark Bradford, which is an artist that we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so you can see she has an incredible collection um, and she really begins collecting in the 70s when she's still a college student. She's a college student at UCLA and she's, uh, she commutes from home and she's with her mother and she recalls that um, it was probably Black History Month and um, uh, she grew up in, uh, in and around Watts. And it was Black History Month and you know, maybe there were some celebrations taking place in the neighborhood and they decided, her and her mother, they decided to go to the Baldwin Hills Mall, which still stands, um, and the African American Museum there, which is still there at um, the now, it's no longer there, I think it's now a Macy's, but it's kind of next to or around um, the May Company as it, uh, as it was at the time. And she noticed a woman that had set up a table there um, by the name of Ruth Waddy. And you can see here, this is a, a lino cut print, a woodblock print um, from 1966. And she was intrigued uh, by this woman um, that was sitting there with kind of an array uh, of artworks in front of her. And her mother urged her, urged uh, Eileen Harris Norton to buy some. If you know if she's interested, um, the works were affordable and Eileen um, Harris Norton actually ended up buying three. And that's really how her collection begins. Um, her collection really starts to ramp up uh, in and around the 80s. Um, she, uh, at this point, is married to um, the software publisher, most famous for Norton antivirus um, software, Peter Norton. Um, they're living in Venice. They really don't have a lot of money at the time because he's just starting his business. Um, and they walk around Venice and they become friends with some of the artists that are working in and around that area. Um, you know, a lot of artists at that time had their studios in Venice, people like Larry Bell, um, uh, Fred Eversley, uh, Betty Saar, um, Chuck Arnoldi, and so they walk around and they get to befriend artists, and um, when they do come into a little bit of money, they begin to collect some of these artists who happen to also be their friends. Um, and so this kind of collecting impetus, um, and, I, and I, I love these stories because it, it almost reminds me of another, perhaps much more famous collecting couple, um, the Broads, you know, where Edie is really, of course, Eli Broad is sort of the, the face of the collection, but we uh, tend to forget that it really was Edie Broad that sort of drove that collection uh, and making it what it was today. Um, you know, Edie, Edie Broad's instincts, and same here, um, Eileen, Harris Norton's instincts really driving the collection here. Um, for example, um, this is an image here with her uh, friend, Mark Bradford, very, very important artist. He represented um, the United States in the Venice Biennale of 2018, I think it was. Um, and uh, back in the early 2000s, Eileen Harris Norton was the very first person to buy a work of art from Mark Bradford. It was a painting, a sizable painting, um, and she, at the time, bought it for $3,500, which is um, really pennies compared to what his work is worth today, tens upon tens and tens of millions of dollars um, at auction and, you know, collected by every single major collection really in the world. Um, and, you know, from, from that point, collecting Mark Bradford's work, they became really, really good friends. Um, and, um, they, uh, so, and they're friends and they both have this kind of philanthropic um, inclination. And so they decide to start this foundation, which is um, the, the foundation, uh, the exhibition that we're gonna be focusing on today, um, Art and Practice, which is in Lamert Park. Um, and the site of this gallery is really quite fascinating. It's really picking up on uh, a history of the area. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning in the introduction, the Harlem, of the West, this kind of idea, this idea that this, you know, it's a center for black art and black thought and um, black culture. 
Um, literally kind of, you can actually see, uh, well, I don't know if you can see, but kind of right here, this little storefront right here um, is uh, the site of the Brockman Gallery, which in the 1960s was the very first uh, African-American owned art gallery. Um, and they also decide to start their foundation in this area, Lemert Park, because this is where both of them grew up. Um, if any of you are from this area or familiar with this area, um, you know, like I said, or I don't know if I said this, but I live about a mile or two away from this area. I live in Baldwin Hills. And um, Eileen Harris Norton, she grows up in Watts, um, which is, uh, you know, not, not too far away. Um, and then uh, uh, Mark Bradford actually grows up in West Adams. And his mother had a, a hair salon in Lamert Park right on this block. And so they decide that this is really the perfect area to site this foundation. Um, and uh, this nonprofit art gallery, as well as a foundation uh, that helps foster youth because uh, Mark Bradford's mother actually uh, was part of the foster youth program. Um, so they have computer labs and things like that in here as well, in addition to uh, this uh, exhibition space. And then just wanna point out um, the owner of Brockman Gallery, one of the owners, Alonzo Davis at the bottom there with Ruth Waddy, who, as you recall, was you know, the artist of the very first artwork that uh, Eileen Harris Norton um, collected, that she started her collection with. So now we're sort of entering the exhibition, um, co uh, Collective Constellations, the idea being that this group of women artists, uh, women of color, um, the connections that they have with each other, you know, some of them are friends with each other, they've worked with each other, they've collaborated with each other, and perhaps that um, some of the ideas that they're uh, tackling are connected to each other as well. Um, so we can see um, over here we have a, this uh, lovely pink wall kind of picking up the pink of Amy Sherald, who of course is quite famous now for her portrait of uh, former uh, First Lady Michelle Obama. Um, in the left there we have a really, it's this tiny little piece over here, um, but I just want to point this out, Wangechi Mutu, who actually does use photographic um, collage elements in her work. Um, her, if you look it up, Wangechi Mutu, her piece, uh, she has uh, the, the niches of the Metropolitan Museum of Art right now in New York, um, have these enormous sculptures by her um, that are just magnificent. They're, they're based on um, African keratids. Um, so kind of bringing this, this African, um, you know, flavor to this very neoclassical building, which I think is quite fascinating. And then Amy Sherald, um, you know, because today we're focusing on artists that are using photography to convey a message, uh, using photography in various ways. And I do want to point out that Amy Sherald, of course, um, does use photography um, prior to her painting, using photography as sort of a, a reference point. And then let's see, moving on from that, we have another slide here. Oh, we have um, oh, the Ruth Wadi piece that we saw earlier. We have uh, Julie Moretu. So already you're beginning to see, um, even with this kind of niche section of her collection, women, uh, women of color, a, a great diversity in some of the works. Julie Moretu, you, who um, I think last year or you know, before all this happened, she had a show at LACMA um, and then um, uh, let's see, this one here, Lynette Yadam Boki, who had a show at the Huntington Museum. Um, and then this one here, we're going to be actually focusing on a couple of these artists. Uh, we have on the left here, this kind of triptych. We have Lorna Simpson, we're going to focus extensively on her later. And then Shireen Nishat, we're going to focus on her as well. Oh, and this is another gallery, Carrie Mae Weems, um, Photographic Arts Council people. You're probably very familiar with her. She's very famous for her um, photography of uh, the American family. And then um, this piece is quite fascinating. This sculpture here um, called Madame, uh, Mademoiselle Bourgeois Noir or uh, Miss Black Middle Class. Um, and again, the use of photography in some way, this was actually a performance, but she, of course she uses photography to capture the performance. And that's the only way that we can know, you know, the true utility of this artwork was through these, uh, these images um, from the 60s, I believe, when this performance took place. Uh, it's uh, this gown that she created out of these white gloves. And basically she went to an art opening yelling and screaming um, thoughts of protest, basically against, um, the art with white gloves on, you know, this idea that um, black people and black artists are kind of um, not gain, are unable to gain entry into the art world. 
Okay, so our first focus uh, kind of deep dive today, we're going to be focusing on four artists today, uh, Adrian Piper, um, Anna Mendieta, uh, Shireen Nishad, as we saw earlier, and then Lorna Simpson. So this is our first one here, first focus. We have Adrian Piper, and I, and I wanted to start with her because this project, um, it's quite uncanny. It's, you know, the, the way that she created this project is certainly something that uh, resonates with all of us right now. Basically, she is holed up in her apartment in New York for weeks and doesn't leave except to uh, shop for groceries. Um, so, you know, all of us in quarantine right now uh, in lockdown are certainly kind of can sort of identify certainly with the activities of this project here called Food for the Spirit. Um, and Eileen Harris Norton has two uh, of the images here. So basically for this project, what Piper does, she's a philosopher. She's an analytical philosopher. She, she's an incredibly important artist. Um, we'll see Lorna Simpson later on. She, you know, she's, she cites Piper as, as a very important influence. Um, and you know, even people like Cindy Sherman and you know, all kinds of very important artists cite Piper uh, as an important influence. Um, so for this project here, uh, oh, and in, the, in 2015, she wins the Golden Lion Award for Best Artist. Um, uh, so, you know, someone with uh, many accolades um, to her name. So basically in the summer of 1971, um, Piper, you know, again, being that she's a philosopher, that she's interested in, in ideas of philosophy, she's reading Immanuel Kant's Critique of Reason. And she becomes so absorbed in this text and basically, um, uh, Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason, basically what it argues is that everything is subjective and that human experience is only the appearance of things and not the actual thing itself. Um, so, you know, for, for a good analogy is sort of, you know, when we talk about color, you know, you red, red is red. Is it, is it sort of intrinsically red or do we all actually see red in a different way? And are we just all sort of in agreement that, you know, this, is called red. Um, so again, that uh, the kind of human subjectivity is, is, is th that there's really no true reality, that it's all subjective. And so she's reading uh, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. She's doing yoga, she's reading and writing, and she's fasting and she's only drinking water and juice. Um, so perhaps, you know, part of, the, part of the impetus for this project too is kind of her, perhaps her lightheadedness um, that she's not um, e eaten for a while. Um, and basically, she becomes so absorbed in this text um, that she feels that she's beginning to transcend her physical self. And so in order to remind herself that she is still rooted in this world, she decides that um, she's going to set up a camera by her mirror. And that every time she feels that she's disappearing, she's going to go to the mirror and she's going to record herself speaking and reading out loud uh, the passage in the book that is making her feel as if she's disappearing and then to kind of concretize her physical, you know, bodily reality that she is still there, that she's not disappearing. She um, takes a, a photo with her camera. Um, and I think it's, you know, the, these are kind of um, darkroom photos. You can see the graininess, um, the grayscale of them. Um, and I think it's quite telling and it's quite, it quite matches the theme of this project that there is a sense that she's kind of disappearing. You know, the, the images are very ghostly. You can't really make out her outlines very clearly. Her expression um, is sort of lost. You know, she, she's not really sure, sure of herself. Um, and just want to show you a few more, an array. There's a total of 14. So Eileen Harris Norton owns number six and she owns number 14. Um, and you can see that she's in kind of various states of dress and various states of being. Um, yeah. Here are a few more. So in a sense, these are sort of, you know, very much kind of quote unquote reality checks that she's, you know, so she's sort of rooting herself um, in, in these photos. And I think, you know, we're today, some of what we're talking about is how different artists use photography. Um, and of course we can't help but relate that perhaps to our own experience. And this is something I think we can relate to using photo to kind of, you know, concretize our own memories or our own being, you know, so, you know, I know for me, if I, if I, sometimes I don't remember a specific memory or something that happened to me, but looking at a photo and suddenly it becomes real again. Um, or, you know, this idea in this kind of Instagram culture that, you know, you weren't there 
if you didn't take a photo of it, if you didn't post a photo of it. So I think this work uh, from back in the 70s definitely relates to that kind of modern concept. So another really important thing about this piece is um, this, this piece, 71, is sort of, um, a lot of critics kind of cite this as, as a transitional piece. It's an important piece. Um, for conceptual art, um, but for Piper's body of work, it's also quite important because these are images of her. Um, you know, you can't help but notice that she is a woman and um, she is a, a woman of color. She's a mixed race woman. And um, because of that, uh, some critics also cite this as kind of one of the earliest instances of, of um, the subject of identity in, in art. And in 1975, um, although I think Piper would, I think Piper would, you know, perhaps, uh, I mean, she's in her, you know, six, um, I, I don't know, actually don't know how old she is, 60s or 70s, I suppose. Um, but perhaps at one point she wanted to be a pure conceptual artist, you know, along the lines of someone like Saul LeWitt, who is considered the fathers of concept, conceptual art. Um, but, so, but the difference being that Saul LeWitt is a white man and considered normative. And so uh, if an artist uh, creates something and she's not a white man, she's a, a, you know, a mixed race or, or a woman of color, uh, kind of automatically um, injecting the sense of identity into her work. And so she begins, um, as you can see here, uh, 1973 is the center work here, the mythic being, and she begins to tackle these ideas of race um, and categories of race full on. Um, to Adrian Piper, she's really interested in, in kind of these arbitrary uh, categories. Uh, so you can see on the bottom here, self-portrait exaggerating my Negroid features on the top, self-portrait as a nice white lady. And then in the center here, the mythic being, the mythic being um, the sense that uh, you, that she is still the same person on the inside, the same experiences, but yet on the exterior, um, something totally different and how that affects the way that she navig navigates the world and how people view her. So back to Food for the Spirit, um, these kind of darkroom photos, grayscale, are, I, I, I sort of feel like they're kind of foreshadowing a, a lot of the later work. Um, for example, a more recent work, um, this piece here, I can't see the date because the, the image of myself is kind of blocking it. Um, let me move that. A little. Oh, 2012. So a little bit more recent. Uh, for her 64th birthday, you know, similar to, to sort of the, um, no, it's not letting me go anywhere. Sorry. Um, uh, this kind of digitally altered photograph, grayscale, and she um, kind of facetiously uh, states, you know, she's retiring her her black self um, and that from now on she's going to be 6.25 uh, 6.25 percent gray honoring her 1 16th African heritage um, and you know it, it's meant to be funny um, but I think it also points out the arbitrariness of these categories of, of, of what's black and what's white um, and what those and what that means um, but of course we can't forget that even even if these categories are arbitrary that these categories um, are used in society to uh, to create or to um, uh, affect real discrimination and, and real mistreatment of people. Sorry, it's not letting me just go anymore. It's not gonna let me switch slides. Sorry, it's not letting me just change slides. There we go. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, we have Anna Mendieta, our, our second artist that we're gonna focus on today. Um, so with Piper, we're talking about these kind of arbitrary notions of what's white, what's black. Um, because she's mixed race, she sometimes, you know, she, people will, will treat her as white, sometimes people treat her as black. So, you know, she's, she's sort of um, privy to, to the arbitrariness of those categories. And Anna Mendieta is kind of interested in, in that as well, kind of societies. Um, treatment of people or categorization of people. And um, she, as, as a woman, and you know, I, I, you'll, you will see a, another photo of her, perhaps a, a beautiful woman. She's interested in these ideas of what's feminine, what's masculine, what's beautiful, what's not beautiful. Um, and throughout her, her, her career, um, interested in kind of shocking people, um, um, perhaps shocking them in, in, into, you know, not taking these categories for granted. 
Um, so Ana Mendieta, a little, a little bit of background about her. She was born in Havana, Cuba, and she leaves at the young age of 12 um, because her father is involved in an anti-Castro contingent. And so at the age of 12, she and her sister, they go to a refugee camp and they stay there for a while until um, they are sent to an orphanage in Iowa. And um, University of Iowa is also where she ends up getting her uh, degree in, in art. Um, and uh, so she, this, this series here, Untitled Facial Cosmetic Variation Stocking, um, and she's, uh, she, there's a whole series of, of these works um, where she basically puts a stocking on her head, she dons wigs, she, wear, she wears crazy makeup, um, and uh, you know, she's kind of exploring ideas of beauty and, and what happens when you mar that beauty and what is, what is the reception of that by the audience. And her sister who um, at, at certain points in, the, in her career collaborates with her, uh, with her on certain videos and certain projects. Um, she, the sister is quoted as saying that part, part of the idea behind this project too is just to, sh to shock people, you know, that she loved seeing people surprised and shocked by her work. Um, and you know some of what we talked about with Piper, I, I compared uh, Piper's uh, desire to be a conceptual artist versus Saul Lewitt's desire to be a, con or Saul Lewitt being a pure conceptual artist. Um, and a lot of times for this work here, um, people often compare her to Bruce Nauman. So I wanted to show you that. So uh, Bruce Nauman's work, um, he, uh, at this point he, um, meets, I forgot who it was, but it was, it was a dancer. And so he begins kind of experimenting with his body. And um, he creates this work here called Study for Holograms, where he's uh, kind of the focus on, on the facial features, especially the mouth, and he's kind of contorting himself. Um, but for Bruce Nauman, he says, you know, this is really just, um, these faces are just about making a bunch of arbitrary faces. And he just is sort of uh, experimenting with that. Um, but with an artist like Anna Mendieta, I think, you know, the fact, again, like Piper, you know, the fact that she is an, a, a female of color creating this artwork automatically, you know, um, when, when you receive the artwork, when you talk about the artwork, you have these other subjects that are uh, brought into play, that being um, race and, and gender. So I think Mendieta, you know, she's, she's uh, so for, for example, this piece here, um, playing with ideas of what's masculine, what's feminine, feminine. Um, this is a schoolmate of hers um, and uh, Morty Sklar, and she cuts, she cuts pieces of his beard and places it onto her own face, um, kind of exploring um, and kind of pointing out too, kind of, again, the arbitrariness um, of, of these categories. Um, and oh, one other thing to point out too, uh, for Bruce Nauman, you know, this is Bruce Nauman's work and then her work, the fact that she brings in wigs and stockings, I think uh, automatically brings in this idea of gender into her work as well. And this is uh, one of her most famous pieces uh, called Silhouettas, or this is a very famous series. This is this piece in particular may not be um, the most famous, but the series is certainly famous. Um, and I, this work I think is quite poignant. Um, you know, she's placing these stockings on her head. Sometimes she uses kind of fake blood and, and um, uh, uh, kind of uh, tries to shock the audience with this use of blood and, and violence. Um, and this piece here, you know, perhaps, it gives us some insight into why she's doing those works. Uh, you know, she, as I mentioned in the beginning, she's a refugee. She comes here as a young child at the age of 12. She's kind of completely displaced. And uh, she really, you know, from early on notices, um, you know, her reception as a woman of color in, in this foreign land. And perhaps that's why she creates so many pieces that kind of highlight um, and augment her outward appearance to this kind of st strange level, um, perhaps that to her kind of mirrors uh, her, her inner, the inner incongruity that she feels. And then this piece is maybe an answer to that. She, um, for this series called Silhouettas, uh, she places her body on the ground um, and she's literally kind of rooting herself in her, in her now, you know, adopted homeland and trying to create a sense of belonging and kind of this literal naturalization, um, if you will. So the next artist we have is Shuri Nishat. Um, and 
she, like Anna Mendieta, is, you know, is also an immigrant. It is, is also displaced. Um, she, here, I'll show you this other image. Her, uh, this is a series she does called Women of a Law series. This is the piece that's in, the, in um, Eileen Harris Norton's collection. Um, but this is a good image to, uh, to look at because this is actually the artist herself in this image. Um, they're not really meant to be self-portraits. They're meant to sort of represent, you know, women of Iran in general. Um, but of course, this, this is the artist. Um, and Shireen Nashat is as well like Anna Mendieta. She's an immigrant. She comes from afar and uh, like Anna Mendieta, you know, Anna Mendieta when she was a young, young child, she's a refugee. Um, Nashat is sort of dealing with similar um, themes in her life as well. She comes to the United States for high school actually, and she ends up staying uh, through to her MFA at UC Berkeley. And while she's, while she's at UC Berkeley, um, she discovers, you know, and she, meanwhile, her father is sending her money. She's having good contact with people at home in Iran. Um, and suddenly in, um, I think, 1978, 1979, the Iranian revolution um, breaks out and she is completely cut off from her homeland, from her family and her friends and the, the money that is uh, supporting her from her father. And so, um, again, like Anna Mendieta, this, this sense of displacement and, and being moored on, on this strange land. Um, and about, after about 12, a dozen years or so, um, so, you know, the revolution breaks out in 78. Um, and it isn't until 1990 that she's able to go back to Iran. And she's just completely shocked by what she sees. She remembers Iran as being a colorful country, a vibrant country. And because of the Islamic revolution, uh, she dis discovers and experiences something totally different. Um, and she says, uh, this, it was, this is a quote from her. She says, it was the most shocking experience I ever had. The difference between what I had remembered from the Iranian culture and what I was witnessing was enormous. I, um, I had never been in a country that was so I ideologically based. Most noticeable, of course, was the change in people's physical appearance. Um, because at this point, women are now veiled uh, by order of Islamic law. They must wear the shador or the, the veil. Um, and when she returned to the U.S., she, was, she says she was haunted by the experience. Um, and I think it's very poignant. And perhaps that's why her entire body of work is, is black and white. You know, like, as I mentioned, she remembers the, the Iran of her growing up, you know, up until she leaves for the U.S. for high school as being this colorful, vibrant country. And then when she's finally able to return, she sees black and white or you know what she feels is this black and white country um, with uh, strict Islamic uh, rule and so she comes back to the US oh and this is an interesting point too she actually doesn't even though she gets her MFA at Berkeley she doesn't create any art she from Berkeley she goes to New York she's running a nonprofit gallery but she's not an artist um, she's involved in the art world but she's not an artist and it isn't until she returns from Iran that she sort of is the inspiration is sort of sparked and is the catalyst for her, um, you know, 40, you know, for, uh, I guess, 30 some odd years career as an artist. Um, so she begins the series called Women of Allah, where uh, she acts as the model. Um, but again, they're not necessarily self portraits. Um, they're sort of meant to stand in for women in general uh, of Iran. And um, the only place, the only features that are shown are the feet, the hands and the face because under, uh, under Islamic rule, those are the only parts of the body of women that can be shown. So she's very, you know, she's being very particular she, uh, or she, you know, she makes these choices for a reason. And then the script that you see on these body parts on her face and on her uh, feet, on the feet here um, are inscriptions of two very important, um, some uh, two of the most important um, Iranian writers. Um, and this is where you know, this work is, ju is just so fascinating um, because we have two poles here. We have these two uh, Iranian poets. Uh, on the top here, we have Farouk, Farouk Zad, and she is, uh, many Iranian women really hold her up as a symbol of, of sexual freedom and creativity, creati creative freedom and personal freedom. 
Um, and, uh, because at the age of 16, you know, kind of following this traditional path, she, she marries at the age of 16 to a man who's double her age, um, or not even her, not double her age, but 15 years older than her. A year later, she has a child. So she, I guess she's only 17 when she has a child. And that's, uh, once she has her child is when she writes her first uh, collection of poems or her first book called Captive. And I think the title alone tells you how she feels about marriage and perhaps motherhood in, in some respects. Um, and three years later, she ends up leaving the husband and kind of following her own path. She, you know, continues writing and um, she, she dies quite young in her uh, 30s, I believe, but uh, is held up uh, in perpetuity as kind of this symbol of, of personal, you know, female freedom. And then on the other hand, so again, these are these two poets that she's used, that uh, Shireen Nishat is using in, she's quoting both of these poets in, in this series, Women of Allah. And um, the bottom there um, is also a symbol of female liberation in, in, a, in a way, but, some, but a, in a very different, of a very different sort. We have Teresa Farsadeh at the bottom here. And she, you know, similar to Farouk Farouksad, she um, also leaves her husband at a young age. She ends up um, coming to the U.S. to study um, University of Iowa. When she returns to Iran in the 70s, she suddenly, um, uh, she suddenly decides or she suddenly is convinced that, you know, Islamic rule is the only way to cure, as she says, um, the, the wasteland of contemporary Iran. And she writes these poems that basically urge women to take up arms and to, to fight in the Islamic revolution. So, um, I, you know, it's, it's just so fascinating that basically Shireen Nishat is kind of presenting to us two very different ideas of what uh, female, um, you know, of what, of what Iranian feminism can mean. And she's not, you know, she's not giving us a prescriptive uh, one path. She's giving us these, com these two completely different poles um, and perhaps, you know, uh, impl implying that everything in between um, uh, can go as well. And I think, you know, she knows, uh, Shireen Nishat knows that the, these are being received by a Western audience. Um, so I think part of this project too is uh, kind of dispelling these notions of Orientalism, um, uh, these ideas, these stereotypes of Islamic women or Muslim women or Iranian women, um, you know, and this Orientalism reaching all the way back to the 19th century painters like Delacroix and uh, uh, Jerome uh, uh, and, and romantic paint, other romantic painters. Um, this idea that, you know, of, of, the, of the harem or, you know, of the, of the passivity of the Middle Eastern woman. Um, and, and she's really kind of offering us maybe a, a different story from, from what has been told in, in Western history. So here it is again, the, the image. And then another kind of layer to these works is um, what Nishat has also talked about her, uh, herself, Shereen Nishat has talked about herself, uh, kind of the, the strange sensuality of these images, um, you know, and she says, and this is a quote from her, she says that Muslim women are the sexiest women in the world because they are that what happens when you're so covered when Islamic rule mandates that you must not even have eye contact with the opposite sex, that there almost creates this artificial sexual tension that may not have been there were it not for these rules and laws. And um, that because these women are covered up, it creates this, you know, overpowering sense of mystery um, and, and this kind of sexiness and sensuality um, that certainly is not intended by these laws, but um, because of human nature and kind of natural human desire crop up. Um, and, you know, especially for this image here, if you look in the background, you see, you know, some of the rest of her body, you see what looks like her arm there. And then, you know, of course, the way that this pistol is kind of, you know, between her legs here. Um, so I think there's certainly an undeniable um, kind of sexuality in these, in these images. So our last artist here that we're going to close on is uh, Lorna Simpson, uh, who I've already mentioned a little bit. Uh, she is very influenced by Adrian Piper. She, like Adrian Piper, is considered a conceptual artist. So certainly not documenting anything in particular, you know, not documenting um, something, um, but, you know, presenting certain ideas to the viewer. Um, this piece here is, is called Tense, um, but before, before we get to this, we're gonna come back to this. I just wanna give you a little bit of a range of, of her uh, body of work here. 
Um, these are these wonderful collages. So this is actually a work also in I Eileen Harris Norton's collection. It's not in the current show uh, that we're talking about, but it is in her collection. And these are silk screens of these um, wonderful collages that she does. She cuts out ebony and jet magazines, and then she kind of adds this flourish to them, um, which is quite wonderful. Um, and if you are interested in Lorna Simpson's work, she actually has an online show at uh, Hazard and Worth right now that you can check out full of these collages because she's actually um, not stranded, but she's in, she's Brooklyn based, but at the moment she's actually working out of a small studio in Los Feliz um, because that's where she ended up having to quarantine. Um, and so because she has a smaller space, she's not, in, in Brooklyn, she has entire building um, custom designed for her uh, by a, a very important architect whose name escapes me now. Um, but uh, it's the same architect as the African American Museum in Washington, DC. Um, but in Los Feliz, she just has a little one room studio. So um, a lot of the work at the online work at House and Worth is full of these uh, little uh, collages here. And then this is another uh, show of hers, uh, also at Hauser and Worth. So as you can see, she's not working just in photography, sculpture, painting, installation, video, uh, a, definitely a multimedia artist. And this is a show um, based around the idea of ice. Um, and to her, uh, this idea of ice, I think it, it's quite poetic and poignant. Um, you know, the fact that ice evaporates, that it, you, know, you sort of can't grasp it in, in some ways. There's like a giant snowball on the left here. Um, uh, it really a meta, this idea, the idea of ice being a, a metaphor for kind of the, the search for equality in this country that she sort of, not necessarily that she believes it, but she's setting out this idea that this task um, to achieve equality is perhaps futile. Um, so, but going back to, you know, tents here, I just want to give you some background for works like that. These um, are uh, earlier works. This one is 1989. Um, and you can see that uh, she does a whole series of works like this and uh, uh, many critics have called these anti-portraits because you know we're, we're shown the back of, of, of this model um, and a lot of the images um, like this the heads are cut off you know so they're not really meant to represent anyone in specific um, and they kind of occlude you know our sense of, of the person. Um, but for example, guarded conditions, and, and this is um, some of the tactics that she's using in tents that we're going to talk about in a second, um, but guarded conditions and the play on words is just so smart and, and the, the layering of meaning in, in this. Um, so we have this repetition, this idea of seriality, you know, we have the portraits, um, several, or not portraits, but these, this image of this woman several times over, purposely dressed in a very simple, perhaps cotton um, house dress, purposely meant to draw to bring to mind, you know, the clothes that enslaved peoples, you know, um, might have worn. Um, and then guarded conditions, you know, um, kind of the double entendre of all these words, guarded conditions, the, you know, the fact that this woman, you know, with her, her back to us, that she might feel guarded. Uh, but at the same time, that society, you know, because she's a, a, a black woman might feel guarded against her and, and you know, for no reason of her doing, um, she hasn't done anything, but you know, that society might be guarded against her. Um, and then you can see at the bottom there, again, this, this idea of repetition, sex attack, skin attack, sex attack, skin attack. So that society is guarded against her, be not just because of, of her race, but also of her gender. Um, and then this one is a similar idea, uh, you know, kind of it, it, what, what is it like at some, you know, I, I mean, Lorna Simpson, I'm sure she you knows there are, parts of her life that are very wonderful. She's a very famous artist, um, but, uh, and making a lot of money, but, you know, the, the, you know, her experience as a black woman in this country, you know, Monday through Friday, um, and, uh, you know, miss, miss description, misinformation, misidentify, misdiagnose, misfunction, all these negative words that she's attaching to the, the black female uh, body or black female woman here. Um, and then again, the play on words, miss, you know, not just um, this idea of the negative, but miss, misgage, misconstrue, mistranslate, miss also as in misses or miss, you know, the, the, the gendered aspect of this. Um, which brings us to, uh, this is our last slide, I believe, and then we're going to do Q&A. Um, so this is our, the last work uh, that we'll focus on today, Lorna Simpson. And again, the, the kind of, the really ingenious layering um, of meaning on, on this piece here. This piece is called Tense. This is um, in the current show in Eileen Harris Norton's collection. 
Um, and we see here two women flanking, or not two women, but or the same model, but images of this of this woman. Um, and again, wearing a simple dress uh, like one might wear in, uh, like the enslaved might have worn in, in um, the era of slavery. And her back is to us, and so is the back of this African mask. Um, and I love the, the display of this work. It's almost to me like an altarpiece and, you know, kind of a very architect, the way that it's kind of um, uh, gridded here. Um, but her back is to us, um, and uh, you know, so she's kind of denying us access, you know, this idea in art of the gaze, you know, when you look at, when you look upon something, the idea that you're kind of owning it or that you're possessing it and she's denying us that. Um, and the, the mask is also turned around as well. And the mask, of course, when you think of the mask in art and art history, uh, we have people like, you know, Picasso or Matisse, or Modigliani appropriating facets of African culture or, you know, other, other people, other music, I mean, not music, other music, other, other facets um, of, of art and culture that appropriate images or ideas or music or concepts from African culture or African American culture, and yet, you know, denying entry to mainstream society or those, or those institutions to the people that have created um, these cultural products. Um, so the mask, you know, being turned away from us as well. And then the use of language again, we have, at the, we have these little plaques here with, with um, it says present, past imperfect, present imperfect, past perfect, future perfect. So this idea that tense doesn't, doesn't just refer to the tension that one might feel looking at this, you know, again, Lorna Simpson is well aware that most of her audience is most likely a white audience. Um, you know, statistically that's who goes to museums and galleries. Um, so sh she's calling out the tension, you know, um, between the races and, you know, between the audience, perhaps, and, and the work of art. But, you know, very literally, we have these kind of grammatical tenses, right? We have present, past and perfect, pre the tenses here. Um, and, you know, the present um, being informed by the past, you know, that perhaps some of the reason we still deal with this tension is that our country has never dealt with its past. Um, and then, um, and then a really kind of, you know, interesting um, facet here, the last plaque there says future perfect. And um, this, this I think you could take to mean different things, future perfect. Um, it makes me think of this kind of genre, this genre of art and music uh, and culture, um, Afrofuturism, which is this idea, um, you know, art, uh, musical artists like George Clinton, or even, uh, you know, even more popular example, the movie Black Panther, you know, Afrofuturism being this genre of science fiction um, or art music culture that uh, posits um, black figures, black men and women as queens and kings and, and heroes. A lot of it is, or the root of it is based on Egyptian or non-Western myths, um, but of course can take many forms. So future perfect, you know, it makes me think of Afrofuturism that in the future, you know, there's kind of this, um, uh, you know, idyllic um, conception uh, of these people. Um, and I think you could take that to mean different things. I think future perfect, you know, um, it could have a very bleak meaning, you know, that our country is so mired in these tensions um, that the only place these tensions can be resolved is in science fiction, is in an alternate reality, is in movies um, like Black Panther, um, that our country will never be able to reckon with its history. Um, but I think there, and you know, depending on the viewer too, it could also have a, a very hopeful meaning that the future perfect, um, you know, if you're talking about the future perfect tense, which is in the future, this will be done. Um, so I guess if you're talking about future, you could say in, in, in the future, we will, or there will be racial and gender equality. So I think, you know, that is really the ingenuity of her pieces that you can really parse the words and the images to mean so many different things. So that is the end of our exploration and we're going to do some Q and A. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll give you a little uh, applause since we're in the, in the void, the Zoom void. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, it was so interesting. Really interesting. So I want to uh, encourage you all, we'll have a few minutes for uh, Q&A. So please type in your, your comments and questions in the Q&A box. Um, 
And while that's happening, I want to just uh, encourage uh, PAC members and our attendees today to, to, to engage with art and practice. It's a really um, terrific, interesting institution that, um, you know, we, that we all should know about. And so hopefully when we are, when we reemerge, we can um, go and pay them a visit in person. But in the meantime, check them out in, on their social media channels and their website, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, we have a few questions coming in. Uh, Michael Hawley asks, as contemporary photographers of color, Piper and Mendieta were so ahead of their time in the 70s. Is this the first time they've been shown together in an exhibition? Um, Piper and Mendieta, this is the first time that they've been shown in an exhibition together. Um, you know, I honestly am not sure, uh, although I can say most likely yes, because, um, hold on, let me pull up the slides of, of their work here. Um, so we have Mendieta here. And Mendieta, and then we have Piper. Um, I don't know for sure. I will say, however, that Piper, uh, Certainly not recently, because Adrian Piper, um, I mean, I'm just kind of imagining the type of show that they would, the fact that they're both female and artists of color, and it's really only been recently that, you know, there's been kind of an interest in going back to the art historical record and shining a light, you know, the, in the, one of the, the first slide I showed was Alma Thomas, the painting of Alma Thomas, and there's just recently been an interest in her work. Um, even though she's working alongside or in the same time as, um, you know, Jackson Pollock, someone like that, uh, Lewis Morris or someone like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I can only say that most likely not within, not recently, um, because in the year 2000, Piper, again, this interest um, in, you know, kind of obfuscating or occluding these categories of black and white, she declares that she will no longer be in shows that are sort of only about women or only about being a woman of color. So, yeah. So kind of um, moving on that same subject, Claire asks, uh, Piper and Mendieta are a generation older than Nishat and Simpson. Did they open the way for the two younger artists? Yeah, I think so. I mean, Piper certainly is a, is a very important artist. I think a lot of artists cite her as an important influence. Mendieta, her career was cut short. She died very young, I think only 32 years old or something like that. But she, um, may, maybe not in this group of artists, but I, I believe it's Carrie Mae Weems actually, or was it Lorna Simpson? I don't remember now. Um, I'll have to double check. Um, uh, but they, you know, have actually there's actually a work, a work that they do that's titled, um, I forgot the title, but the, the Anna Mendieta's name is actually in the title. So um, definitely, I think these are, you know, precursors to some of these younger artists for sure. Very cool. Um, Yi Wei wants to know what this show title means, Collective Constellation. Oh, I think I mentioned this a little bit in the beginning. Um, collective constellations, you know, this idea of a, of a collective of women, um, constellations, um, kind of the connect, you know, when you have a constellation in the sky, you have these, you know, you're connecting these stars to create a full picture. Um, and that's what this show is trying to do. They're trying to connect the dots between these artists to create a fuller picture, a fuller meaning. Um, so yeah. Is Eileen Harris Norton actively collecting still? She is. I don't know about her, you know, more, for example, the little golden egg that you saw in the first image um, or one of the first images, um, that's certainly a recent acquisition. Um, that's by a younger artist, Sean Shim Boyle. He had a show at various small fires a year, or two, you know, maybe a couple years ago. Um, I did see her I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm sh I don't know if she bought anything, but I did see her at Freeze, uh, the big art fair uh, that occurred prior to the shutdown it, back in mid-February. 
Um, so I think she, yes, definitely. She's still very active. And then, you know, the fact that she's involved in art and practice, I think she's constantly going to um, remain active in, in collecting. Uh, we have a question from Marjorie. Um, she says, so well done. So some kudos to you. Um, she says, can you please talk some more about women using their bodies and how intertwined their bodies are with their identities? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that's an interesting question. I, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of like a, a, a chicken or the egg question in a way, you know, is, are women using their bodies because society sees a woman for her body or is, you know, or is it the other way around? Um, and um, yeah, I, I think, you know, and I think this also connects to what I was talking a little bit about with Piper um, and relates to some of the artists too, you know, the fact that Adrian Piper wanted to just sort of be a straight conceptual photographer, but because of her identity as a mixed race woman, you know, her career her, her, and a lot of her artworks, or a lot of her body of work kind of moves in this other direction because, um, you know, you, I, I think we of course have a determination in who we are, but I think a lot of who we are also has to do with the way others see us. Um, and if people are constantly talking about your work, um, you know, as, as a, that this is a female work, that this is a, a black artwork, um, I think at some point that's going to seep in into what you're doing. Um, and perhaps that's exactly why in 2000, Piper decides she's no longer going to participate in shows that are, you know, about being a black female. She doesn't want to be, you know, constrained to that classification. Um, it is a through line. I mean, all, all of these women are using their bodies um, in their work. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if Lorna Simpson is using her own body in okay. those works. Um, you know, you certainly can't see the face. So I think sure. even if it is her body, it's, I, I'm pretty sure it's not her own body, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess it's sort of you're addressing something. It's sort of like the elephant in the room, you know? When, when you talk about a woman, you, you talk about her appearance. And so it's hard not to address that, you know? Um, so Michael Hawley has pointed out that uh, Anna Mendieta had a show at the Jeu de Palme in Paris last year. So if you're interested in learning more about her, um, you can look uh, on yeah. their website, jeudepalme.org. I also read a book uh, called Who is Anna Mendieta? It's a graphic novel, which oh, is about her life. She mm -hmm. has a very interesting and tragic life story, which if you're interested in learning more about her, I recommend. It's pretty cool. Um, and Adrian Piper had a show at The Hammer. So mm -hmm. that's another place to look if you want to learn more about her. And I Sharita think Anna Mendieta, or she was at least involved in a show recently at the Hammer. Maybe it wasn't a solo, but she had a big was section. It that, was it the PST? Um, I think so, yeah. I think Clara will know, but yeah. I shouldn't say things. Yeah. I don't really know what I'm saying. But maybe it was. Uh, radical women, Clara saying yes. Thank you. Uh, and then just, there is a question um, about Gwen Norton, yeah, I think that must be Peter Norton's, you know, another, so this is a, a, yes. Oh, I didn't even really, oh, I did address it. Yeah, so this, Peter Norton is her ex-husband. So this is Eileen Harris Norton. Oh, and then Michael Hawley pointed out the, the name of the architect who designed uh, uh, Lorna Simpson's uh, studio complex in New York, David Atje. What do you hear? Yeah. Architect. Uh, we have a few thank yous. Excellent presentation. Um, I think that we'll leave it there. It's just afternoon. Um, so thank you very much, Jennifer. This was really, really terrific, interesting. I'm glad we were able to experience this show from our quarantines. Um, th uh, keep Stay tuned for more events from PAC LA as we uh, continue to navigate this this moment in time and uh enjoy your holiday weekend everyone so thank you everyone so much <laughs> we'll see you next time thank you bye bye